verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing. He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff. Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all. Two more verses. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So over the next few weeks, as we are... are I don't know if we have ended the Tough Topic series. I don't know if we're going to come back to it. What we're going to do for the next few weeks going into Easter is... We are going to take a look at some of the stories to pull something out of them on something to uh, teach on, to, to springboard us into a specific teaching for that week. So I'm calling it the journey to the cross. So um, now, if you're like me, you're less concerned about what we just read. You're less concerned with the heaven opened up, right? And, and like God. God speaking from heaven. You're, you're less concerned about that. You're less concerned about Jesus being baptized. And you're more concerned with why on earth did he show that ridiculous video? Okay, that's just me. That's what I would be sitting there going. Video to start this passage. Well, here's the answer. Or here's actually, I'll answer that with a question. Were any of those baptism? Okay, I'm like, okay, it took you a second to answer me. I'm like, I thought it was an easy question, right? None of those were actually baptism, right? But they went into water. So the question is, what's the difference of just going into water and what's actual biblical today? So uh, my message for today as we are taking a journey to the cross is the proclamation of Jesus. We are looking at this time where Jesus kind of appears on the scene. He's about 30 years old. He's getting ready to start his ministry. And the very first thing that he does is he goes to John the Baptist to be baptized. And God opens up heaven and proclaims him as who he is, the Messiah. So this week we're looking at the proclamation of Jesus. So we're going to look at baptism this week. Next week, we're going to take a little break. We've got a little something special planned for next week. That'll be fun. Uh, the, the second week that we're in it, so two weeks from today, we're going to talk about the preaching of Jesus. Anybody want to guess what we're going to talk about? The preaching, okay? His sermons, his message. I know, is there another? I'm asking all these hard questions. 
observation of Jesus, and we're going to actually take a deep dive into prayer. And then week four is going to be Easter. It's going to be the persecution of Jesus. So that's kind of the look at our, our, our next four messages, not including this next week. So, so in our story, we've got this guy, John, or John the Baptist, or really he was John the Baptizer. Um, he's, he's doing his thing in the Jordan River, and all these people are coming to him to be baptized. Now, I've got a picture uh, of the Jordan River. So that's me standing, well, it's, it's, that is the Jordan River, but I'm actually standing in a stairwell at the Jordan River. It was kind of in flood stage right there, but kind of over to uh, the right there, you can see that's the actual Jordan River. Uh, on the other side was Jordan, um, and this was right in between. I had just baptized Martin. If you guys remember Martin, our former drummer, uh, he'll actually be here next week playing. I had just baptized him, and I was just getting ready to baptize Susan Cooper. Uh, so that was really cool. So, um, And then I got to baptize two ladies that I didn't know that they asked me to baptize them because they saw me baptizing uh, and they didn't really speak a lick of English and no hablo espanol. And I'm like, I'm trying to talk to uh, somebody and, and they're, they're trying to translate in that. And I, I'm just like, listen, I just need to know that they know Jesus as their savior. And they're trying to, Jesus, yes. I, so I said, I, I think I said something like, Solamente Jesus, right? And they're like, that's about what I got for my Spanish, right? It means only Jesus. And they're like, see, si. I'm like, okay, we're good to go. Let's do this, right? So I, I dunked those two ladies. That was, that was pretty cool. But, but you can see the Jordan River, it's not a whole lot to speak of. I mean, it's, it's um, as the crow flies, it's about 105 miles long. If you were to float down the river, it's super windy. It's about 200 miles long. Uh, at the widest point, it's about 100 feet wide, and it's about 10 feet deep or so. So that's the Jordan River, and this is actually believed to be the exact place, not necessarily where this happened, where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Everybody cool with that? All right, cool. So here we have John the Baptist. He's baptizing all these people. They're coming from just everywhere around to be baptized. They heard about this guy and this baptism of repentance and this cool stuff is happening. And then here comes Jesus, and he wants to be baptized by John the Baptist. Now, we know we talked about it not that long ago. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, okay? So they kind of knew each other, right? But then Jesus comes along and he wants to be baptized. So we kind of have a little here. Matthew chapter 3 verse 13 it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to, what's that word? Deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? See John had a problem because this was a baptism of repentance. And John's like, um, Jesus, perfect, yeah, no, we, what, what in the world? He's like, I, why would I baptize you? You need to baptize me. And it says he tried to deter him. That, that word actually, deter, it's in the imperfect tense, which means he repeatedly tried to deter him. It, it's almost like John was like arguing with Jesus. He's like, Jesus, no, I, I, I'm t I just can't do this. I, there's, there's, it was like this continual thing. So it wasn't like, a, I don't think this is right. And Jesus is like, yeah, we should do it. He's like, okay, whatever. It, it wasn't like that. John was like, no, this is a baptism of repentance. Like this, this, this doesn't seem right. So the question is, if Jesus had no sin, Right? He didn't need confession, uh, he didn't need repentance, he didn't need conversion, he didn't need transformation. Why did Jesus go to be baptized? You ever wonder that? It's a good question. And, and there's, there's a lot of different answers that we could come up with. You know, he wanted to be an example and all this stuff. But he actually gives the answer in verse 15. He says this, Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, what's that next line say? To fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Jesus had to say this one thing. He says, no, 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 we have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. One simple little phrase quickly made John the Baptist change his mind. So, so what does fulfill all righteousness mean? 
It means to do everything required by God. That's what it means. That's why Jesus had to be baptized because Jesus was all about doing everything required by God. I think that should probably be everything that's required by God as followers of Jesus. Jesus was saying, if this is what God commands, then I as a man must do everything that God commands. Regardless of the fact that I am holy, I will be obedient. That's what Jesus was saying with this. Verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, watch this, watch what happens. He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the spirit of a dove, but like a dove alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And at that moment, Jesus was officially like coronated into his ministry. He, he was officially proclaimed as the Messiah to go out and to do what he was to do for his time of ministry and eventually end up at the cross. So... The question is, what is baptism? Why was this so significant? Why was this the thing that started Jesus' ministry? Because Jesus never got saved like we have to do, right? But why was baptism such a big deal that it needed to kick off his ministry? Well, here's a, a definition of baptism that I, I found represents now that's a very 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 key important word baptism represents it's a picture of the forgiveness and cleansing from sin that comes through faith in in jesus christ baptism publicly acknowledges one's confession of faith and belief in the gospel message it also symbolizes the sinner's entrance into the community of believers or the church so that's what baptism is. It's a symbol, it's a representation of the transformation, of the forgiveness, of the repentance that we are claiming that we are doing, of completely turning from our sin, turning from our old lives, turning from our old ways, and turning towards Christ. It's a picture of that. That's what baptism is. And if you look at it, there's a lot of thoughts on exactly what baptism is or how you're supposed to do it or we're going to we're going to break a lot of those down today but the original word for baptize is a greek word called baptizo and we've talked about this before so we won't spend a lot of time but this word baptizo it means to dip repeatedly to immerse to submerge and then another definition of it that i really like this one it's to overwhelm to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, or to overwhelm. That's what baptism is. So, for us to gain a better understanding of what true biblical baptism is, what I want to do today with our time is I want to ask five questions, and I want to answer those five questions. And I believe these five questions are probably going to be the main five questions. If I had everybody probably be the questions that we would hear the most so you guys ready to do this here we go number one here's the big one is baptism a requirement of salvation we're not like we're just taking the the floaties off and we're we're diving right in okay is baptism a requirement of salvation now i want to be sensitive to this because i know many of you grew up being taught that baptism is a requirement of salvation so what I don't like to do is necessarily condemn any other faith. The thing to do is to show and highlight exactly what scripture says. And because it's not about a denomination, it's not about what you were taught necessarily, it is about what God's word says. Amen? Okay, here we go. Is baptism a requirement of salvation? So... To answer that question, I want to do something a little bit risky, and I want to take just one of the passages that is used 
for the belief that baptism is a requirement of salvation. And that's Acts chapter 2. So if you want to turn to Acts chapter 2, uh, we're going to start in verse 36. Just a little Bible quiz. What's happening here in Acts chapter 2? It's the day of... The day of Pentecost, right? So this big deal is happening. Like all of these people get saved. There's like 3,000 people. They're added to the church. Peter is like, he's awesome. He's preaching. This is post-resurrection Peter. Did you know there was two Peters? There was pre-resurrection Peter. He was a coward. He put his foot in his mouth all of the time. He like, he denied Christ. Like, like he was kind of a punk, right? I mean, if we're just being honest. But then there's post-resurrection Peter. He was awesome. He's probably my favorite Bible character because it shows just this incredible transformation that can happen within a person. He was bold. He had courage. He stood up and he didn't care what the consequences were going to be. He was going to speak the truth. So that's what's happening here. Acts chapter 2 verse 36. He says, therefore... Peter speaking, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, and these next three words are three of my favorite words in scripture. Whom you crucified. Picture, just just a couple few weeks before, Peter, this is the same Peter that's denying Christ when a little servant girl asked him, aren't you with that guy, Jesus, that just got arrested? And he completely denies Jesus. Now Peter is looking at all the people of Jerusalem. And and every time I read this, I picture he's got his finger and he's poking it in the chest of these people. He's saying, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. That's a different Peter, isn't it? I love that Peter. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now, now this would have been a humongous deal to them because they were waiting for Messiah for like, what, oh, a few thousand years? They're waiting for this Messiah to come. And Peter right there says, oh yeah, this Jesus that was supposed to be the Messiah, that was the Messiah, you crucified him. And at that moment, they get it. It clicks. Oh my goodness. We were the ones in the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Shouting it over and over and over. We are responsible for this. The crowd realizes that. Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? It's a great question. Man, we really messed up. Uh, is there anything? What, what can we do? We, we realize that we messed up. And, and, and what does Peter say? He says, you need to get your act together. Uh, you need to get your church attendance up. You need to tithe more. And is that what the next verses say? No. He says this. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, very, very, very powerful passage. However, you could read those verses, and when Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, I can understand, if you were to just read that passage, you could see, oh, I have to repent, which means to turn from my old life, to give my life to Christ, and be baptized. Just read these verses, you could see that happening, right? But here's the thing. It's very dangerous oftentimes to just take a little clip of scripture and not and, and, and derive this humongous conclusion about salvation and not compare it with the rest of scripture. Now, does the rest of scripture say anything about salvation and how salvation is supposed to go and repentance and all that? Does scripture say anything about that? Just a little bit, right? Okay. Um, here's, here's one that's probably, if I were to ask you, give me a verse, this is probably the verse that you would go to. Ephesians 2, 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. What do we know about salvation? That it is faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ whereby we are saved. That's it. 
There, there's nothing else that you can add. You can't add to God's grace. You can't do anything like that. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Now, <clears throat> Paul was really smart. As Paul was writing this to the church in Ephesus, he was really smart. And we talk about this all the time. I love that he and other Bible writers do this. He was so smart, he knew that wouldn't be enough. He knew, like, I mean, it's pretty clear, it's by grace you have been saved through faith, period, point blank, that should be enough. But see, he, he knew our hearts. He knew that we would try to add things. So what does he do? Paul goes on, he's like, okay, so in case you didn't get it from there, let me add a little something else so that you can understand. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. So he adds this another phrase on there. He's like, you can't do this. This is a God thing. You are saved, not by... Stop there. He backs up and he says it again because it's like, maybe they're not... Maybe I said it twice and it, I thought it was clear, but maybe they're not going to get it. So let me make it uber clear. I'm going to put the exclamation point on it right here. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So that it's so clear three or four times in these two verses, Paul says, it's nothing that you can do. You can't do anything to add to God's grace or to give salvation you've got nothing to add and the moment that we think that something that we can do adds to god's grace we are fools absolute fools here's another verse titus 3 5 this probably would be the other verse that you would give me now we could pause right there and say would baptism be considered a work of righteousness sure I mean, that's like a thing that we are trying to do in our conversion, in turning and giving our lives to Christ. Like, that's a work of righteousness. That's a good thing. We're commanded to do it as we're going to see it today. But Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, baptism, church attendance, blah, 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 your grandma. Those works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. He saved us. It's nothing. That another one, just in case two wasn't enough, I'll do Paul, I'll back up, I'll give you another one. Our works in comparison to salvation. Now again, we're commanded to do good works, we're supposed to, we're supposed to be salt and light in this world, but in comparison to salvation and God's grace and mercy, our works are as filthy rags. Isaiah chapter 64 Verse 5 and 6, it says, how then can we be saved? Isaiah throws this question. How is it that we're saved? And he doesn't necessarily how not to be saved. He says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. That just means we're sinners. We cannot get into heaven with our sin. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags again we're commanded to do them we're, we're, we're god wants us to to be salt and light and, and get baptized and all of those things but in comparison to salvation if you are trying to earn your way into heaven they are just like filthy rags and you do not want me to give you the description of what that really means because it is the strongest language that isaiah could possibly drum up of what that means that's what our righteous acts are compared to God's grace, his mercy, and salvation. How about another? You want another example? How about the thief on the cross? Now, here's how this story didn't go. Three people hanging on crosses. The one guy, he mocks Jesus. The other thief, he's like, don't you know who this is? I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, okay? Um, he's like, don't you know who this is? And he's like, this is Jesus. He's like, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus is like, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And what the thief didn't say was, oh, hold on, Jesus. I appreciate that. Let me go down. I need to go get baptized first and crawl back up. And he came up and he crawled back up on the cross. And he said, and, right? Is that how it went down? 
No. My wife was laughing at me. I used to teach students, so forgive me. That's not how it went down. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Love the example of the thief on the cross. Didn't have to get baptized. Mark 16, verse 16. Here's another verse that some people could say, well, it says that we have to get baptized. So I'm just going to knock a couple of these out. Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Now that one looks pretty clear, right? I mean, that one, wow, that's kind of scary. Trev, why would you bring that up when you're trying to prove the opposite point? Again, don't just take one little clip of Scripture and not look at the rest of what it says. The rest of the verse says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. What doesn't it say? Whoever does not believe and get baptized will be condemned. There's a reason, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, there is a reason why baptism is very much associated with salvation. But it is not a requirement of salvation. In fact, baptism is an assumption and a command after salvation, not for salvation. When you look through the New Testament, baptism is pretty much always connected to salvation. So, number one, is baptism a requirement of salvation? No. According to scripture, according to what we've looked at, and there are so many more verses that we could look at, we just scratched the surface, the answer is no. Baptism is not a requirement. Number two, kind of baptized as a believer. Kind of backing up and answering the question a little bit more here, but kind of a different angle. Acts 16, verse 46. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he, what's that word? So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Again, when we look at the New Testament, Pretty much when you see somebody converted into Christianity, whether it was a Gentile or from Judaism into Christianity, what did they do immediately following? They went and got baptized. That's why we see it in this close connection with salvation. But again, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us their faith in Jesus, not be baptized, and still go to heaven? Yes. Yes, it is possible. If you're not baptized, yes, you still go to heaven. But here's a better question, and here's how I want us to think about this. Is it possible for a person who calls themselves a follower of Jesus to be an obedient Christian without being baptized? No. No. The answer is no, we cannot be an ob at least in full obedience and not be baptized. And again, in the book of Acts especially, pretty much every single time we see a conversion to Christianity, we see them, the very first thing that they do is go be baptized. And again, back to Jesus. What was the very first thing that Jesus did to kick off his ministry? Again, he didn't have to get saved, so a little bit different from him, but his coronation or his proclamation, he went and got baptized. So, baptism is an act of obedience, not a requirement of salvation. Number three, you guys tracking along with me here? Three more. Number three, do I have to be completely submerged or is sprinkling okay? Ooh, now we're going to split some hairs here, right? Because now, yeah, you guys are chuckling, you know why. Okay, so remember the definition of our word, baptizo. It means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, or another definition is to overwhelm and I really really like that definition to overwhelm especially in this part so if the word means to submerge would sprinkling be sufficient 
Not necessarily, not really. Now, let's, let's paint a couple scenarios. You're trudging through the Sahara Desert. You have half of a canteen of water left. Okay? It's possible, okay? You decide... Vultures are circling, right? Right? The guy that you're traveling with, you're not a believer. The guy that you're traveling with is a believer. He's like, you need to turn to Jesus. You're like, I, I think you're right. You turn to Jesus and you're like, I want to get baptized. Sahara Desert, half a canteen of water. Can you be baptized? Not fully submerged, no. At that point, could you take, I would probably drink it. I'm just, sorry, Lord, I don't, I don't know where that falls on the, you should do this or not do this. And dunk it on you, and would, would God look at that and go, okay, cool, you got baptized, you get credit. I don't even know what that means, okay? But like, would that count? Sure. I'm sure that God would look at that, and I'm, God, I don't mean to speak for you, okay? But like, that would probably be okay. Now, Pastor Tony has told me a story. I think it was Pastor Tony. You correct me if I'm wrong. it would be weird to do while I'm on stage, but I just figured I should supposed to say that. Um, he was in a hospital of somebody on their deathbed, received Christ right there, obviously couldn't get them out of the bed to fully submerge them, and he took a bottle of water and kind of did one of those, right? Does that count? I think so. I think so, because it's about the heart, it's not about the water. With all that being said, if you're able-bodied and you could hold your breath for like 0.1 seconds, I think it should be complete submersion. It's, it's in the word, baptizo. Now, more than just a definition, I want to I wanna take a little bit of a deeper theological view of this. Anybody ever heard the phrase baptized into Christ? It's in, it's in the Bible. Okay, here, here's an example. Romans 6, 3 says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into Christ? It's 3, 26. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, another silly example here, but we'll, we'll paint a picture so you can see where I'm going with this. Hot summer day, and you take your kids to the pool, and, and they are so excited, they can't wait. And they're like, you know, you're, you're supposed to go to like your chairs and like, you know, take your jewelry off or, you know, take your hat off and take your shoes and your socks off. And like, like you see kids and the kids don't, down here don't really wear socks and shoes. They wear flip flops, but they like barely have kicked their flip flops off and they run to the pool, right? I mean, is this a thing that happens? Right. They're running to the pool. It's like 8,000 degrees, you know, outside. And they run to the pool and they stop and they sit on the edge of the pool and they dunk their feet in the water. Is that what kids do? No. Kids, they run and they jump. And what do they do? Cannonball, right? I mean, they are all in. All in. That's a picture of being baptized into Christ. When you, when you become a believer, you don't know everything. You don't exactly know how all this works. You just know that there is a good and gracious God who gave his son for you. And like, like, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done some really, really messed up stuff. I need Jesus. I don't get the whole rest of the Bible. Maybe that'll come. Maybe it won't. But like, I know I need Jesus. Boom. You become a believer. Like, does God want us to just sit on the edge of the pool and dip our feet in the water? No. He wants us all in. Now, that takes time. we got to figure it out. We're going to stumble along the way. We're going to make some mistakes. But God wants us to be all in. That's what baptized into Christ means. In fact, it says it right here in the verse. It says, uh, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. It's that picture. Think of like this big jacket or a coat. And you put it on. And what does it do? It completely covers you. That's what clothed in Christ means or baptized into Christ means. It means you're all in. And that's the picture of baptism. Now, 
when, when you get baptized, now picture, picture actual baptism. Most of you guys have seen this happen or you've been baptized before. When, when, when I take somebody and I, I put them under the water, and you know, some people, they need a little bit extra time under the water, okay? <laughs> now you're like, you're not baptizing me, <laughs> right? So if just for that split second when they're under the water, Yes, you can see them through the water, right? Because hopefully the water's clear, except for in the Jordan. It was like mud, okay? And it was cold, okay? But like, what's completely surrounding them? Water. Water. Completely surrounded, completely covered. It's the same picture of how Christ is supposed to be in our lives. Baptized into Christ. Completely submerged. Clothed with Christ. That's why fully submerged water baptism is so important. Again, not because there's anything special about some dirty water, but because it is a picture or a representation of... That's what baptism is. So here's our definition of baptism again. Here's the question. If baptism publicly acknowledges one's confession of faith and belief in the gospel message and also symbolizes the sinner's entrance into the community of believers or the church, then why would the symbol just be sprinkling and not a cannonball? That's what it ought to be. Following Jesus should be a cannonball. Are we going to mess up? Yep. Are we not going to get it all in the beginning? Yep. Are we going to have to start over sometimes and go, God, I really, really, really messed this up, but God, would you forget? Yep. All of the above, but it should be an all-in approach. So answer this question, according to scripture, is sprinkling okay? Is sprinkling a good picture? No. It's not. Again, and I'm not trying to attack any denomination, faith, what you were taught when you... It got really quiet in here. It, it, not what you were taught. I'm not trying to attack anything. I'm just trying to highlight what Scripture says. And again, remember, baptism is so much more than going into water. It is a picture of how our lives are supposed to be with Christ. So... Can babies or children be baptized? Ooh, we're just going right after it, huh? Acts 2, 38. Peter replied, we read these verses earlier. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. Now, is it possible for an infant or a young, young child to repent in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and have a full understanding of what that means. Is that possible? It's not. Now, older children, yes, I got saved when I was young. I got baptized right there when I was 10 years old. Okay? Children, yes, when they can understand it. But scripture is very, very clear that there must be an understanding. Repent and, or it could say, and then, I'm not trying to add to scripture, but and then be baptized because that's the picture that we see in scripture every single time. Repent and then be baptized. That's the order in which to do that. Not be baptized and then hopefully you get everything else squared away in the rest of your life. That is not what we see in scripture. And again, I know I'm not trying to attack how you were raised or your denomination or your faith or what you believe. I'm just trying to highlight, highlight what the Bible specifically says. So again, if children have an understanding and acceptance of true biblical salvation, absolutely. They can absolutely be baptized if they have decided to give their lives to Jesus. But that requires a conversation that requires them having a true understanding. But there is no scriptural evidence of infants being baptized or actually, I don't even think there's any example in scripture of a child being baptized. Now, does, again, does that mean if they have an understanding? Yes, I believe so. Again, I was 10 years old. I was, believe me, way still a child. I'm in many ways still a child now, okay? But... 
yes, but infants, sprinkling, not according to scripture. Number five, last one. I was baptized as a baby. Should I now be baptized as a believer? Now let me ask you this. Based on the biblical evidence that we've covered so far today, what do you think? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Paul, in Acts chapter 22, is retelling the story of when he was converted, when he had that moment on the road to Damascus, when he met Jesus and, and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And that whole deal when Saul was blinded, he kind of was led into town and he met this believer, this follower of the way named Ananias. And this guy, Ananias, and he's, he's kind of, you know, brother Saul, and, you know, and he's talking to him, he wasn't called Paul yet, and he's having this conversation and he says this very strange thing to him. It says, you will be his witness, talking about God's witness, to all people of what you have seen and heard. Now watch what he says. Remember, he was just converted, like he's, he's still blind, like he has these scales on his eyes, like this weird, weird thing is happening to him. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash away, wash your sins away, calling on his name. That's pretty clear, isn't it? What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized. Now, I would love to say that we're going to have a baptism today. We are not. Okay? Maybe could have planned that out better. However, we do have a baptism plan for April 16th. That's a Sunday, right after service. That is the week after Easter. What an amazing Easter gift to give to Jesus. If you have never been baptized as a true follower of Jesus, what an amazing gift to give Jesus for Easter, to be baptized. So right after service on April 16th, we are going to walk out of these doors. I'm not even going to lock the doors. We're going to go uh, right out to the ocean, and we are going to go hop in, and we are going to baptize whoever wants to be baptized. I think that is going to be amazing. I love it when we do it out there. You guys clap and yell and scream and hoot and holler, which is absolutely amazing because that's the picture. It's a picture of us celebrating to a good person, but from dead to alive. That's the picture. So that's what we're going to do April 16th. Uh, out in the lobby on the tall boy tables on the back wall right there, there is a sign-up sheet. I want you to put your name, your phone number, your email address. Uh, I will contact you. Just have a quick conversation. Pretty good understanding of what baptism is and what the requirements are to be a true follower of Jesus. Uh, but I may call you and have a conversation with you. Uh, but man, I would love to just see as many people out there to take you out, just baptize you and to celebrate that occasion with you. Is that cool? Let's pray. God, you're celebrate. God, that it, like, like I just said, you don't take broken things and fix them. You don't, you don't, you don't take just you know, sick things and make them well. You take dead things and you make them alive. And God, I'm so grateful for that. Thank you for the perfect picture of your son, Jesus. As he hung on that cross and he gave his life, his life was not taken, but he freely gave his life. He was buried in that tomb three days. Another picture of baptism. Being in the earth. But that's not the end of the story, God. Three days later, your son Jesus rose again. Proving that he had authority over sin, over hell, and over death. God, thank you for the gift of that salvation. Thank you that there's nothing that we have to do, no hoops that we have to jump through. But thank you that you made it a free gift and it's all on you. And all we have to do is accept that gift. God, if there's somebody here this morning who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, right now in this moment, would they realize how good of a God you are? How it is worth following you. 
So in this moment, God, if, if they're here in person or attending online, if they do not know you as their personal Savior, right now would they just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, I give you my life. Save me and change me, God. I trust in your son, Jesus, and Jesus alone to wash away my sin so that I can spend eternity with you. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that prayer this morning for the first time, I'd love to know. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to celebrate and pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up so I know I got it right today. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. God, you are so good. So, so, so good. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, God, as over these next few weeks as we take this journey to the cross that we can see true examples of your son, Jesus. How we're supposed to live. God, help us to be obedient followers of you. Whatever that means. God, I pray for this time of offering and to follow communion. God, that you would be honored and glorified in all that we do, say, and think. And it's in the awesome, powerful, mighty name of Jesus. Amen.